You know, as we are uh, approaching summer, my mind's been thinking through, you know, all the things that I associate uh, with summer. And I remember this one moment when I was a kid. We were on a family vacation, and we were up in North Carolina, and we were staying in a cabin. And I remember we walked to this cabin. We'd never been there before. I was like, oh, look at this cabin. And we walked out on the porch to see the view, and it did have a beautiful view. And I remember turning around and covering the entire porch were moths. Now, it was daytime, so they were just there, I guess, sleeping. I don't know what moths do during the daytime, but they were sleeping or they were just still, and I remember at first being kind of creeped out because there were just moths, it seemed like, everywhere on that back porch. But as I looked closer, it was actually just fascinating because it was moths of every single shape and color all over that, just kind of resting there dormantly. But what you know, as well as I do, is that night, when the porch lights came on, those moths went crazy, right? I mean, we, we all know that um, because you know that phrase, um, uh, like a moth drawn to the what? To the flame. And so you know, like whether you're, you're camping and there's a campfire or you have like a lantern or some kind of, or, or some kind of thing or like a porch light, moths, they're just drawn to that light. Like they go straight to that light and um, I always thought it was for like a simple reason, like, I don't know, maybe they see bugs in the light and they eat them. But it's something actually, I had to do a little research. I was wondering, like, what's the real reason that moths are just drawn to the light? And um, the leading theory on that I was pretty surprised by. It was pretty fascinating. What they said is that moths, and there's other insects like this, moths are wired with a pretty sophisticated navigational system. And the way that they were made is that they actually use the moon as their point of reference as they're flying around at night. So there's the moon that's fixed right there. They then know how to fly. Well, when they see an other light, so maybe like a campfire, that throws off their navigation and they go towards that light and they can fly right into the fire and actually die. And as more and more, as you know, the invention of the light bulb, as more and more lights are just around the world at night, moths get kind of, um, they get off base, they get overstimulated by these artificial lights that's not their main point of reference. They get off base and they fly towards these uh, artificial lights. I was thinking about how that's very similar to how we operate and very similar to one of the most important discussions in our present day, in our culture today. One of the most important discussions. And the, the gravity of this discussion could not be overstated. Is there's a huge discussion in, in our generation, in our culture, with what is, which of all the guiding lights out there, what is the precise guiding light you fix the whole navigational system of your life to? We pick one primary point of reference as kind of that fixed point from which we navigate our, our lives. It may be like one kind of timeless, fixed light, like, like a moth with the moon, or there's many other artificial lights. And here's the challenge. With this array of artificial lights, of other lights out there, if we get off base and we get distracted by these other points of reference, we can fly right towards them and we can even fly right into the fire. The results can be devastating. So what I want to do is I want to show you this text because it speaks to this dynamic and it speaks to the dynamic of discerning what is your primary fixed point of reference and guiding light. And as you're discerning what that is, it'll help you kind of clear away what some of the other distracting points of reference are so you can make sure you're, you're actually headed in the right direction and not headed into the fire. I want to show you um, the, in the book of Jude, I want you to open up, if you have a Bible or Bible app, to Jude chapter 20, or excuse me, chapter 1, verse 20. There's only one chapter in Jude chapter 1. Verse 20, uh, if you've been journeying with us for the last few months, you know that we've been working through the book of Jude all spring. We've done several series in the book, book of Jude. This is actually the last uh, lesson out of the book of Jude. We're going to wrap up the book today. We're going to take a look at, at verse 20, but if you're just now joining us, let me just give you a little context and background 
This is written by a leader in the ancient church, and he's writing to a group of Christians, a community of Christians, writing to a, a church, a group of Christ followers. And there's a specific reason he's writing to them. These Christians, there are some among them that have, a, that have gotten off base on what they believe, and they're spreading these other theories and ideas and doctrines. They're spreading them, and they're gaining an influence. The problem is these doctrines are causing a lot of division, and people are wrecking their lives because of these. And it doesn't give us the specifics of exactly what they believe, but they just give us the basic truths, which I think is strategic. Basically, what it tells us is there's a group of people. This is how they want to live. There's certain things they want to do, how they want to treat people, how they want to act, how they want to handle uh, their lives, handle their relationships. And so this is what they want to do. And so then they've retroactively, they've kind of reverse engineered it to construct a series of beliefs that gives them permission to do what they want. They know what they want to do, so they build a belief system that supports that. Now, they don't tell us the specifics of what that is, but I think that's strategic because it's, that's the same thing that happens generation after generation after generation and is, is part of what we need to sort through today. I want you to check out what it says in verse 20. Let's jump in Jude chapter 1, <clears throat> verse 20. But you, beloved, building yourselves up in your most holy faith, and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. Now, I love how these verses, this verse starts. And we, we took a look at these verses last week, and I just want to touch down on a couple parts of this because they're so powerful. I love how it starts out. It calls us beloved. This is such a, a common way to describe a follower of Christ. Jude uses it. James uses it in the New Testament. In the New Testament, you have Peter uses it. John uses it. Paul uses it. It's one of the most common ways to describe a follower of Jesus is beloved. And what I think is just so deeply stirring about that is I think at the core of us as humans, man, that is what we want the most. Deep down underneath anything else, we just want to be deeply loved. I'm not just talking like have people around. I'm not talking about have like people that we share interests and we do things together. We go cycling together or you go golfing together or whatever or you watch the same movies or whatever it may be. It's not just people that share interests. That's companionship. No, we want to be loved. We want to be known. Like part of being loved is being deeply known. It's not only being known, our, our flaws are known, and our strengths are known, and yet we're loved anyway. And I think underneath us as humans, it's not hard to find where that just kind of fundamentally is just what we ultimately desire. We want to be loved. And what this is saying is that we are ones who are loved. It's calling us that. And we're loved, it says, by God. Think about how profound that is. God is the one who knows you and every part of you. He knows you better than you know you. What it says in the Bible is before you speak a word, he knows it. He knows wherever you go. He knows when you're asleep and when you're awake. You know, I heard a statistic at one point that when you're sleeping, you swallow like 18 spiders throughout the course of a year or something crazy like that, okay? I've heard that. Some of you are nodding like I've, I've heard that before, okay? I don't know, but God knows. <laughs> That's what I want you to realize. He knows how many spiders you actually have eaten, okay? When you're asleep, he knows. When you're awake, he knows. He knows every part of your life. He knows everything you've thought, everything you've done. He knows every single part of your life. He knows it. He knows you better than you know you. And he loves you. 
He loves you. How much does he love you? He, he loves you in a way where he calls you, he loves you so much, he calls you ones who are loved by me. That's the name he gives for you. It's not like a status that you kind of, you're kind of in that love and then you're out of that love. You kind of earn that love and then you lose that love. No, no, you are called that. It's a name given to you. It's declared over you. And it goes on to say how you've gotten to that place where you've been called beloved. It says, we wait for the mercy of God. We wait for his mercy to be fully revealed. Why are you called love? Because of God's mercy. We were unlovable, but Jesus Christ came to earth. God in the flesh on planet earth who did no sin, the only one who did no sin. And yet he was willing to suffer our rejection. He was, we rejected him. He was humiliated and tortured and mocked and died a brutal death, crucified on a cross. And that was a sacrifice offered to God to pay for our sins. And on the third day, he rose again from the dead. Why? How could he do that? He's God. He was God. He defeated sin and death. He loves you so much. Do you see how costly it was for him to demonstrate his love for you? It cost the treasure of heaven, Jesus Christ. That's how much he, he loves you. He's extended to you mercy. So then this is what he says next. Let's, let's keep going. Let's pick it up in verse 22. It says this. And have mercy on those who doubt. Save others by snatching them out of the fire. To others show mercy with fear, hating even the garment stained by the flesh. Now, there's two metaphors in there that I, I want you to just kind of take and, and put a pin in it because we're going to come back to it later. He, he talks about saving some from the fire, snatching them out of the fire, and he talks about garments stained by the flesh. I want you to take those two metaphors. We're going to circle back up to them in a minute. In this text, he says, okay, you've been shown mercy, and so now he says, so now let me give you a command. He says, there's three groups of people among you. He says, and remember, there's these, people that, um, there's these people that have these dangerous belief systems within this community of Christ followers. And he says there's three different groups. He says there's a group that's starting to waver. They're doubting. They're starting to hear what some of these people are saying and teaching. And they're like, man, I don't know. I'm, I'm struggling because there's something about it that sounds right. Now I, I thought I knew what I believe. And now I'm, I'm kind of like struggling. I'm having a battle inside. I'm doubting. I don't know what to do. They says there's another group that are like, actually, this is starting to sound good. And so now they're starting to walk down this path of this teaching and they're walking in that direction. They're walking towards the fire. And then there's others. He says that these are those that are standing in there and they're sharing these different beliefs. He says, man, be, be careful. Have a sense of, of fear as you approach them. But he says one predominant thing. He says this twice. It's a command. He says to all of those groups, Show them mercy. Is that a big shocker? We're a group that have been shown great mercy by God. So then it would be only logical that we would then be a group that would be defined by mercy, right? If we're a group, we all say, we look around we're like, man, I've, been, I've received the mercy of God yeah, man, you should hear my story. You should hear my story. Man, we all, none of us are perfect. We've all received this incredible mercy of God. Then that would be one of the most defining, should be one of the most defining characteristics of our community is a community that shows mercy. We say, okay, well, I hear that, but what do you mean by mercy? I mean, let's define mercy. Well, that's a great question. And I'm so grateful because Jesus was actually asked a question just like that and he gave one of the most memorable answers in all of the Bible. He's talking about showing love. And um, someone came up and said, okay, we're supposed to love our neighbor. Got that. But who is my neighbor? I want to get this exactly right because I want to know who I, who I need to love and who I don't have to love. So let me get this exactly right. Who is my neighbor? And Jesus says, well, let me tell you a story. He's never going to make it that easy. Let me tell you a story. He says, a guy was traveling along the road between Jerusalem and Jericho. And right, that, right there already, the crowd was probably like, oh boy. 
Because that road, there's a huge elevation difference between Jericho and Jerusalem, which means you're traveling up around these hills. It's very desolate. It's very rocky. There's a lot of twists and turns. It's an extremely dangerous road. You would never travel that road alone. I mean, if you're traveling that road alone, the, probably the crowd's like, well, you get what you're, I mean, you're asking for it. I mean, what you, you get what you deserve. I mean, if you're going there alone, so you're like, oh boy, this isn't going to be good. A guy's traveling along that road, and all of a sudden, sure enough, a group of bandits jump out. They beat him within an inch of his life, steal all of his stuff, including his clothes, leave him on the side of the road to die. And they're all like, yep, saw that coming. And then he says, but who should pass by but a priest? So maybe for us, we'd say a pastor. He's maybe on his way to Jerusalem. He's going to serve at the temple. So it's a pastor. He's driving to church. And on his way, he sees this bleeding and hurting and broken person. And what does he do? Jesus says, goes to the other side of the road and keeps walking. Well, wait a minute, Jesus. What are you telling me? A pastor would do that? What, what's, why is he doing that? I don't know. Maybe there's a number of reasons. Well, look, I'm, I'm busy. Someone else will help him, but I can't be bothered that I got to get to the church and do my thing. Well, look, this is a really messy situation. Like, I don't even have clothes on. Like, I'm not sure I want to get, I mean, people might think that, like, I beat him up if I stand here, or maybe they think I'm stealing stuff from him. It's too messy. I can't be associated with this. I don't want people to get the wrong idea. And what if he's dead? If he's dead, I've touched a dead body. Now I've got to go through a whole cleansing ritual because I'm a priest. So I can't be, I can't be bothered with that. Someone else will take care of it. And he crosses to the other side of the road and keeps going. Then Jesus continues. He says, ah, but good news. A Levite came by. These are the people that work and serve at the church. So it was a church leader. Maybe they were a leader in the kids' ministry or the student ministry or they led a small group or maybe they were a greeter. They never missed a time to serve at the church. A Levite came. Oh, great. It's a church person. And here's what Jesus says. And they walked up, walked to the other side of the road and kept going. Well, why would the Levite do that? I don't know. Maybe he's like, look, I... I'm sorry. It's hard for me to feel bad for this guy. If you're going to walk alone on this road, you get what's coming to you. So someone else is going to have to deal with it. I've got stuff to do. I'm going to keep going. And then Jesus picked a third person to come across this, this man. And you probably know who it is. But before I tell you who it is, it's hard for us to conjure up the visceral feeling the entire crowd must have felt when he said who walked up next. Like the only way I could say this to you is I want you to pick in your mind. I just want you to hold it silently in your mind. That group of people that so diametrically oppose all you believe in value. Like who would that in your, your, hold it in your mind, just who that would be that you're like, look, even thinking about that group of person or that type of person, it just gets me angry just thinking about them. That's what Jesus said. He said, and then walked a Samaritan. And they're all kind of shifting a little bit, like, where is this going? Okay, this is not good. Because every other rabbi would say, and then the Samaritan, like, kicked him down the hill or whatever. That's what they're expecting. Now the Samaritan stops, heals his wounds, takes his cloak off and covers him, picks him up and puts him on his own donkey, takes him to an inn, Get, and trusts him to the innkeeper, leaves money behind so that, hey, and make sure that this man is well, and then tells him, and I'll be back by to make sure if you had any other expenses, I'll cover it. I mean, talk about going out of your way, a costly kind of act of love. And so then Jesus turns to the man who asked him the question. So that, of that story, which of those three would you say showed love? And the man can't even bring himself to mention through gritted teeth, the Samaritan one. Can't even say that. So he says, the one who showed him mercy. Same word. And Jesus says, now go and do likewise. See, we think of mercy, we think of like a judicial, like, you know, you don't get what you deserve or whatever. But this word means like compassion. It means like when you see a need, you go out of, when there's a need presented in your path, it doesn't matter who it is, you go out of your way expending yourself to show mercy. 
That's what, what this is, is meaning. It, it, it's the same kind of mercy we've, we've received. I mean, how could you go more out of your way than leaving heaven as the Son of God coming to earth, becoming like a tiny little human, and then being rejected and suffering and dying and, going, and, and suffering hell itself to be resurrected? I mean, that's going pretty far out of your way before you are ascended back to heaven to show love and mercy. That's what we've received. So that's what we mean by mercy. It's this extravagant expense of ourselves to show love to someone who's hurting and broken. We're to be a community marked by that. So what does he say in here? That's what what mercy is. We've been shown it, so we're supposed to show it. We're supposed to be defined by it. And here's what he's saying in this text. There's a group of people. They have a way they want to live, So they've created a belief system that gives them permission to do that. That's one group of people. And and he says, in your midst, Jude says. Then he says, there's then a group of people that are like, yeah, this sounds good. And they're walking towards that like a fire. And then there's a third group of people that in reference to that teaching that they're like, oh, man, I'm... Now I'm struggling, like it seems so clear, and now I hear this, that sounds pretty good, and now I'm internally struggling. And, and what does Jude say should have been and should be their response to all three of those people? Mercy. Extravagant, costly love to them. And see, this is same dynamic is playing out in our modern times. There's a discussion in our generation that is the same dynamic. There is a discussion that there's doctrines and beliefs because, hey, this is what, how I want to live. Let me create a belief system that supports that. And so here is then the debate in our culture. And it comes back to this. What's the ultimate anchor point of reference for how I live and make decisions in my life? What's the guiding light, so to speak? And here's how we answer that question. We we, we talk about it sometimes around here as subjectivism. Our, Our culture defines that by saying, here's your guiding light. You want to know what's true? You've got to find out what's true for you. We say things like this, just look inside your heart. You've got to just be true to yourself. Look inside. You don't know what to do. What do you feel is right? Just get some time, look internal, find out what you think is right, and whatever is, feels true in your heart, that's your guiding light. Your guiding light is found inside. That's what our culture says. And it's like, okay, so that there's this light right here, but what about the guiding light that is outside of me, that timeless light, like a moth in reference to the moon. Like what about an external truth that is actually shaping what's inside? See, I've, we've got to decide in this modern time whether we're going to buy into what our culture says is, look, find truth inside that affects what's outside, or there's truth that's outside and it shapes what's inside. Is it inside out or is it outside in? Do I follow my heart? Do I look inside? Do I find my own truth? Or is there such a thing as truth that shapes and conforms my heart and my thoughts and my life to it? If we don't work that out, we might be flying right towards the fire and get burned. See, thinking that truth is found deep inside of me, we know that that's not true. That's not a sustainable system of belief. We know that's not true because I don't know about you, but I'm wrong a lot. And I think you know that you're wrong more often than you want to believe you're wrong. In fact, just this past weekend, I relearned that while I was playing Monopoly with my children. So I I grew up playing Monopoly. I used to love that game as a child, and I brought it out and taught it to my kids over this weekend. Rebecca and I did 
um, and they're six and, and almost eight, and so they had never played of Monopoly, never even heard of it before. It was so fun, like, teaching them all these things. What are these different color spaces? And, and then, you know, oh, no, you go right to jail and all this stuff and, like, all the strategy and negotiation. It was so much fun. It was a blast right until I got out first, okay? My son, who's six, wiped me out, all right? which just makes me a little concerned about my you know, mental capacity. But anyway, he had all the light blues and had hotels on all of them. I was stuck with the yellows. No one ever wins with the yellows, okay? The houses are too expensive. I can't win with the yellows, but that's the only monopoly I had. I got stuck. I got wiped out. It was so bad that Rebecca at one point looked at me, and she handed me $1 from her monopoly money and said, here, it's because you're pretty. <laughs> and you know what I did? I took it. Thank you. Okay. It's no $10 for being second place in a beauty contest, but I'll take it. Okay. I take that $1. All right. So I, I lost, but I remember we were playing Monopoly and I played that all growing up. And, and I remember like, uh, you know, different families have their rules, but I um, like to at least start the game by playing by the set rules that the good people who invented the game, you know, that they have established. And so we were having this discussion, and I was like, yeah, I'm, this is the rule. I don't think that's so. No, I'm pretty sure this is what happens if you do that. And so like, that's fine. I'll go and I'll look at the, the instructions. And I could have sworn that I knew precisely the rule. And when I looked at the instructions, I'm like, I can't believe I was wrong. In fact, I've been playing all my life. I thought this was true. It's not true. And by the way, did you learn about this and this and that? And I was surprised. I was surprised how wrong I was. Okay, we're wrong. There are things that we would just say, no, I know for sure I'm right, and we find out we're wrong all the, all the time. We do that all the time. That's a silly example of why we kind of know we shouldn't trust what's inside. But can I give you a more serious one? Can you imagine if we as a culture applied the idea of subjectivism, basically trust what's inside, can you imagine if we used that belief system and applied it to the subject of bias and prejudice? We would never do that. Why? Because we would just free everyone to say, hey, what do you feel is right? And we would just perpetuate generations of racism. Well, this is what feels right. It feels like I, I'm better because I'm this, and they're bad because of that. So we know as a culture, you've got to have an external truth that actually transforms and shines a light on bias and prejudice. We have to have truths like all men and women are made in the image of God. Shine its light into the dark corners of our heart and soul and uproot where we've got bias and prejudice in our lives. What's that? That's not looking inside and saying, what do I feel like should be right about that, that person? No. It's saying, I need my heart transformed. Every one of us do. See, we know that that's not sustainable. But the prevailing and growing thought, it's really the prevailing religion of our, of our culture is that truth is not some fixed, timeless truth that God has preserved for us. No, no, it's an artificial truth that's inside. What I feel is right is right. And if we start flying towards that, man, we're flying right into the fire. It shapes all kinds of things about how we live out our life. Well, I feel like this is right, so I'm gonna do it. Even if it hurts me, what if there's something I feel like is right and it hurts everyone around me? Should I still do it? Well, it's my truth. No, we need something that challenges and checks and holds accountable and shapes what's inside. This is a prevailing, growing, growing truth and growing doctrine, and so it shapes how people parent their children. And now parents are, are instructed, hey, step back, let that child look inside and figure out what's true for them. And yet we inherently know that's dangerous. What if that child feels like it's right to go play in traffic? What would you do? Snatch him out of the street. What if your child's like, here's what I feel like's right. I feel like I know that that burner is bright red, but I feel like I want to touch it. We know that that's not true. And yet parents are told and taught, 
hey, let your child discover and figure out deep inside who they are. That's not what this text tells us. It says that we have to stand firm and protect one another. And so what is it that we then say? What is uh, the source of truth? Is it found inside? No, what we believe is that God knows that we're broken. And so he's given us a truth. He's preserved for us his word, his words as a truth. This is how we know the, the, the main the main doctrine that this scripture teaches of all kinds of things into our life, but the fundamental thing is that there's a person named Jesus who was sent to die to pay for our sins so that we could be saved. It tells us who we are. We're beloved. That's what this teaches us. And it's teaching us to find freedom and how to love one another. And so what we believe is, no, his timeless truth. We bring it into our hearts and we shape our hearts and our minds to become like he is. Let me bring this in something even more specifically. This is how important this particular debate about what is your guiding light. There is no area in our culture, there's no discussion in our culture that this is more this debate between inside truth or a timeless truth is more in the center of the discussion than when it comes to our culture's discussion about LGBTQ issues. And probably as I say this for those of you watching online or those of you here, there's probably people here that are in, on all different sides and opinions of those discussions. And it may be very confusing and disorienting because from your vantage point, whichever side you're on, you may look and be like, look, it's so obvious. I don't understand why so, like, that person believes that. I can't believe that person believes that. Like, it's so obvious. And what may be so confounding about that discussion is it's missed what is at the source of that discussion and it comes back to where's your guiding light. If someone believes the guiding light is inside, and that's going to shape what they believe on that discussion. If someone believes that the guiding light is outside, timeless, and it shapes what's inside, they're going to come to a completely different conclusion. And so here's what this does. This text guides us how to operate. And here's what it says. First of all, it says, show mercy to each other. Show mercy. Show mercy to those that you're, that, whose views are diametrically opposed to yours. Show mercy. And what does mercy mean? Costly, out of your way, love to care for them. We show mercy to one another. If you're a Christ follower, you have received so much mercy so let that be the defining factor of your life, the defining characteristic of your life, because you probably have people in your life that have a diametrically opposed view to you. You may work with people, have people in your family. It might be a, a parent or uh, an aunt or an uncle or a, a, a sibling or one of your children. You say, well, how am I supposed to operate? This tells you. Mercy. Mercy. As you've been shown mercy, show mercy. When, when you, how did God show his love to you? While we were still enemies of God, running away from him, his love kept running after us, pursuing relationship. Isn't that right? So show mercy. Never stop representing the heavenly father to all of those around you. That's how we operate. We show love and mercy. Now, let me speak more directly. Maybe you're here or you're watching online and you would say that, yeah, I, I would actually identify with the LGBTQ community. Maybe you would identify with that community. And if that's where you're at, let me just share a few thoughts with you. The first one is this. If there's one thing that you need to know that the Bible says, it's that you are loved 
by God more than you could possibly fathom. That he's after you. That he loves you. He sees you. He knows you. And he loves you. And how great is his love that he sent Jesus to earth to die for you on a cross and he paid for all of your sins like he paid for my sins and he's after you. And salvation is offered to you through Jesus Christ. You are loved by God. He sees you as his child. And here's the second thing I want you to know. That you are loved by this church. You say, well, look, I don't know how you could say that. I mean, the only thing I've ever heard about, heard from church is that um, apparently I'm, I'm going to hell. And you know, if that's all you've ever heard from a church, I want you to hear just how deeply sorry I am. Because I know from my friends that would consider themselves part of the LGBTQ community, what they've shared with me at times is the hateful, hurtful words they've heard from people, some of whom were in a church or called themselves Christians. And so I am so deeply sorry. And what I would like to do is just clear up what the Bible says about heaven and hell. It says that every one of us have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. In other words, every single one of us are on a path to hell and in desperate need of salvation by Jesus Christ. And what it says is God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son that whoever believes in him, whoever believes in him will not perish and have eternal life. And if there's something you can know, that heaven and hell does not stand in the balance by what we do, by but what Jesus did. Because it's by grace we have saved, not by works of righteousness that we've done, but it's by grace we have been saved through faith. That salvation is by grace and it's, it's faith that is offered to us. So anyone who confesses with their mouth that Jesus is Lord and believes in their heart that God raises them from the dead, you will be saved. Salvation is by Jesus. Salvation is in no one else. There is no other name under heaven by which you can be saved but by the name of Jesus Christ. That's what salvation is based on. And so here's what that means. We are a community of broken and hurting people all pursuing a person named Jesus who's rescued us. And anyone that wants to follow after Jesus is welcome to join us. And here's what a, a true marker of someone who has surrendered their life to Jesus, have put their faith in Jesus, a true marker of that is a life of surrender to Jesus where we hold nothing back from him. We say, Jesus, I surrender all of, me, all of me to you. My belief system, my thoughts, my traditions, whatever it is, my doctrines, I surrender my relationships, my sexuality, my time, my dreams, my career, my resources. I surrender all of it to you, Jesus. And if you, anyone who wants to say, Jesus is my Lord, and I am on the journey of learning how to surrender all of it to Jesus, anyone who's that is welcome to journey with us because we have to have mercy on each other as we are in this path of surrendering more and more because every one of us would say, man, every passing year I realize, oh, there's another part of my life that I have not fully surrendered to God. And what you need to know about our community is that we're a community that has settled what our guiding light is. Our guiding light is not looking inside and finding what's true for us. We know that what's inside needs to be cured. Our guiding light is this love story that he left for us of how he rescued us. It's this truth. It's the scripture. That's what shapes us from the inside out. And if you're part of that community, you might be saying, okay, well, yeah, but what does that book say about sexuality? And um, right out of the gate in the first couple chapters, it, it speaks to this whole issue. Here's what it says. It says that God made each one of us in his image, and he says that he made us good. It says that he made us male and female, two genders reflecting the nature of God. In chapter two, it says that his design for the sexual relationship of humanity, he brought a man and a woman together in the covenant of marriage. 
and they became one flesh. In chapter three, it then tells us that sin crept in and so deeply spoiled so much of what God made and brought pain and brokenness, fracturing that relationship. And every single one of us now experience brokenness that we need healing, brokenness in our relationships, brokenness in our sexuality, brokenness in our hearts, in our perspectives, and we need the healing of God to go to work in our hearts. We're a community of broken people who've been called beloved. And you say, well, okay, if that's what the Bible says, then what does that mean if I surrender to God? And ultimately, that is an adventure you will go on with the Holy Spirit. It's an open-ended call to follow Jesus wherever he leads, and that's the same open-ended call each one of us are on. But I want you to know that, that you are loved because we've been loved so much. We will show love. I want to close by taking you to a passage in the Bible. It's really the background of this passage in Jude. And it's so profound that I want to just read it to you. It's five verses in the book of Zechariah. It's a vision that Zechariah has. I, I want to share this vision with you. Let me just read it, okay? It, it, it's a vision he has about a high priest named Joshua. This is what he says. Then he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan, standing at his right hand to accuse him. And the Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, O Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is not this a brand plucked from the fire? Now Joshua was standing before the angel clothed with filthy garments. And the angel said to those who were standing before him, remove the filthy garments from him. And to him he said, behold, I have taken away your iniquity. I've taken your iniquity away from you and I will clothe you with pure vestments. And I said, let them put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head and they clothed him with garments. And the angel of the Lord was standing by. Here's the picture. You've got this man named Joshua. He's the high priest, and he's standing before Almighty God. And on one side is the angel of the Lord. Think, think Jesus is on one side, and on the other side is Satan. And Satan is doing what Satan always does. He's just accusing. He's just standing next to him. He's just pouring condemnation. Do you, do you know what you've done? Look at what you've done. Look how terrible you are. You're, you're, you don't deserve to be here. No one wants you around just pouring accusations. And Jesus can't take it anymore and he rebukes Satan and commands him to be quiet. He says, how dare you rebuke? Don't you know this is one who's been plucked from the fire? You see the language in Jude there? Plucked from the fire, that's who this one has been snatched away from the fire. And then it says, and Joshua looks down to look at his robes. And it says he's wearing filthy garments, same language in Jude. He's wearing filthy garments. The, the words in Hebrew are even more explicit out of Zechariah. It's like clothing soiled with human excrement. He looks down and he sees how polluted and soiled his garments are. And so that actually gives credit to the accusations that he's being leveled against him. But not when he's been snatched out of the fire and his iniquity has been washed away. What is the new word? He's been, his, his old clothes are being removed. His old sins, they no longer define him. That is not who he is. He's being clothed in pure, blameless clothes. And that leads to how the book of Jude ends. Can I read this over you, church? Because this is your story. No matter who you are, no matter what your walk of life is, no matter what's in your background, this is who you are because of the person of Jesus. Here's what it says. Now to him who was able to keep you from stumbling, and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy to our only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. Does that make you want to celebrate, church? That is who you've been made to be. Your identity is not one that you look down and you say, look at my polluted clothes. Look what I've done in my past. Those have been removed all of your sins have been washed away and he's clothed you with pure garments. He presents you blameless before God the Father. That's the power of our Savior, Jesus Christ. What is your identity? 
Are you this? Are you that? Do you identify with this group, with that group? No. You're beloved. That's who you are. You're loved by God Almighty. Let's keep each other in that love and stand firm in that love. Maybe today you say, look, I, I want to put my faith in Jesus. I want to be washed clean. I want to know that I have his mercy. And if that's you, I want to lead you in this prayer. Would you all just take a moment and bow your head and close your eyes? If you're watching online, just take a quiet moment of prayer. Let's just take a moment. And maybe you say, look, if, if, you're, if what you're saying is true, I'm loved by God, what do I have to do to put my faith in Jesus? What do I have to clean up in my life? No, you just come to Jesus just as you are. And you trust that he's not going to leave you just as you are. But you just come right now just as you are. That's what we all did, and he's still at work in us. That's how much he loves you. And if you're ready to take that step, then just in the silence and the privacy of your own heart, I want you to make these words your words to God. Say, God, thank you for loving me. Thank you for giving Jesus Christ to pay for my sin. Thank you, Jesus, for rising again from the dead and loving me that much. I believe you saved me for eternity, and I'm going to follow after you. I'm going to surrender all I've got to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, if that was your prayer just then, what I want to invite you to do is, if you're watching online, I want you to click that link that says cityrev.org slash faith. If you're here, I want you to grab that connection card. At the bottom, there's a place you can check that you put your faith in Jesus. If you check that box on this card, take it to guest services in the, in the, on the parking lot. They want to give you a Bible. We want you to walk out of here with a Bible. If you're watching online and you fill out that form at cityrev.org slash faith, we'll mail you a Bible so you can begin this journey. Church, we're gonna close with a song that's just a declaration of surrender, that he would break down anything in our lives that need to be broken down so we can live a life of surrender. Would you stand with me as we close with this song?